Sponsored by Brilliant. Go to brilliant.org slash vector to finish your day a little smarter every day. The iPhone 11 is going to be so boring, so iterative, a real yawner, a letdown. You don't need it. Totally, completely, must skip. Facepalm emoji dash thumbnail. That was by no means an uncommon narrative last year when the iPhone 11 rumors started making the rounds. Hell, even once it was announced. Now, just four months later, Apple has released its first quarter 2020 financial results. And well, okay, Doomers. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. Now, you all know how much I don't hate to say I told them so. The misinformers, not the ones who are just wrong. We're all wrong sometimes. We all learn. We all grow. No, the deliberate ones, the ones who do it on purpose to manipulate markets or just to manipulate their audiences because they cause real damage, not to Apple. Apple is enormous. Apple can ride it. But to the people and audiences who put their trust in them and then miss out, get screwed over and lose because there's a real world cost. There's always a real world cost. Hot takes, they burn. That's why I've done a bunch of videos about precisely how and why all of that misinformation was so misinformed. And I'm gonna keep on doing just that. And when the results do come in, I'm gonna analyze them as well to keep everyone honest, including and especially me. So Q1 2020, Apple's first big holiday quarter of the new decade, and iPhone revenue in total was up 8% year over year, which given how mature and saturated the phone market is, shows that there's still room for some small surges when the product and positioning is right. Sadly, Apple doesn't report unit sales anymore because it doesn't help Apple to report them anymore in an industry where few if any other vendors have ever reported them. But lest you think it was some common bargain iPhone that did all the heavy lifting, Tim Cook did say the iPhone 11 was in fact the top selling model every week of the holiday quarter with the iPhone 11 Pro and the iPhone 11 Pro Max coming in right behind. Overall gross product margins were 34%, down from the 38 or 39% they'd been since the end of the Jobs era until far more recently. Which, yeah, once again shows that while prices might be up under Tim Cook, it's because Apple is spending more to make devices, not just charging more for them. In fact, now Apple is charging less and eating more of the difference. Apple listened, some will say. The market wanted the iPhone to be affordable again. And they're right. I think the price drop from the 749 iPhone XR to the 699 iPhone 11 was certainly a big part of it, especially psychologically. That would explain the iPhone 11's success. But what explains the iPhone 11 Pros? See, I think what the market actually wanted most was respect. Like I've said before, Apple's mistake wasn't selling a $999 iPhone. It was selling the iPhone for $999 and then making the iPhone XR look and feel discounted, less than, worse. And nobody likes to feel that way about something they're buying. It makes them feel that way about themselves. I made a video on the need for this long before it happened, but that was the real correction Apple made, putting the iPhone 11, the iPhone, back in the sweet spot and positioning the $999, the Pro, as a premium option on top of that. That made everyone feel great again. Great enough to push the iPhone 11 to new record revenues in the Americas, Europe, Asia Pacific, and even kickstart solid growth again in China. Where? Despite a trade war and facing incredibly strong competition from local vendors like Huawei, the iPhone managed to rebound. Which, when you think that this time last year, Apple and Tim Cook were coming off a letter to investors revising earnings for only the second time in the company's history, primarily due to the iPhone in China, shows fairly damn remarkable navigation of incredibly complex market conditions by the company and its CEO, so clearly, so always doomed. Apple is also reportedly seeing massive growth in India, which is a market it's struggled in for ages. The reason? iPhone 11 and also iPhone XR. Yeah, the disappointing iPhone XR. Taken together, it's almost impossible to believe the major business publications still haven't bothered to fix that really weird glitch in their autocorrect systems that keeps prepending the word declining, lackluster, flagging, stalling, faltering, slumping, slowing, waning, sputtering, downturning, business damaging before the word iPhone in all of their coverage. Now, you think being so wrong so always would motivate all the pundits to pause, to reassess, 
to grow. But we're already seeing the same thing with the rumored iPhone 9 this spring and expected iPhone 12 this fall. Not just that they'll be boring, because of course they'll be boring, but because we're reaching peak phone and simply don't need anything more or better anymore. But there are a couple important things to unpack there as well. First of all, unlike most of the tech pundits, real humans simply don't buy new phones every year. People getting the iPhone 11 weren't primarily coming from an iPhone 10R or 10S. They were coming from an iPhone 6 or iPhone 6S, and apparently taking advantage of trade-in programs twice as much as before. Later this year, people getting the iPhone 12 won't be coming from the iPhone 11 either, but from iPhone 6S and 7. And every year, when people upgrade, Apple wants them to get the best possible iPhone they can get. One that's not just great when they get it, but stays great, able to get software updates and run the latest apps until however long it takes for them to want to upgrade again, even if that's the iPhone 15, which yes, should also be the best possible iPhone they can get when they get it. There's a ton of work that needs to be done on software and services and interfaces and voice assistants and all of that, absolutely. But that work is gonna need, it's gonna depend on the same amount of work being put into ever better hardware, better chipsets, better radios, better battery tech, better displays, better devices that are easier to carry and easier to use. It all goes hand in hand because the phones we have now, tiny tech miracles that they are, still fail us all in so many ways, so many days, that they still need to be pushed forward, even in hardware, hard. We may well have reached peak pundit, but we by no means have reached peak phone. Which brings us to the equal and opposite concern that's been resurfacing recently, that for all its doomedness, Apple is still way too dependent on iPhone revenue. It's a variation on the same theme though. You're not making enough money until you're making all of it, and then you're making just way too much of it. Apple reported services revenue of 12.7 billion, another record high, but growth of 17%, down ever so slightly from the 18% last quarter. While the iPad and Mac were down, especially the iPad, which is something I'll get into in the near future, wearables were up explosively, 44%. And that's with both the AirPods Pro and the Apple Watch Series 3 being constrained throughout the quarter. In other words, Apple couldn't make enough of them to meet demand. And these are two products that were widely mocked and dismissed when they were announced and for years after by many of the same tech experts, by a company that's supposedly done nothing of note in the last 10 years, especially in the post Steve Jobs era. The uptick in iPhone sales and downtick in iPad and Mac sales means not iPhone wasn't able to equal iPhone, but taken together, not iPhone was still a business better than most in this world. Especially since the iPhone still feeds so many of Apple's other businesses. About half of the iPad and Mac customers were again new to those products. More than 75% of Apple Watch customers were again new to that product as well. People with Samsung or other Android phones still switch to iPhone far more than the other way around. And once they switch, they start buying more products and services from Apple. And this can actually be a huge challenge since there's a limited number of people on earth and Apple doesn't have stores on Mars. And as the iPhone customer base grows, the amount of upgrade sales were increasingly dwarf new to any phone or switcher sales. But Apple seems to be leaning into that by making devices that last longer and that can be resold or handed down longer and on growing that iPhone platform to be as big as it can possibly be. Given that Apple announced its installed base of devices is now over 1.5 billion apparently more than Microsoft at this point, with almost a billion iPhones alone, maybe two billion devices total in the next five years, all those iPhones create room for a ton of ecosystem growth, both for other devices and services on top of them. Especially as we go from the age of screens to an age that also includes ambient voice and Tim Cook's favorite topic recently, augmented reality. How big? Well, that's where I need Brilliant and its complete math course library. It's perfect for students as they progress through school, professionals who want to brush up or advance in new areas, or anyone who just wants to learn something new, like algebra, geometry, and calculus. Brilliant is a problem-solving based website and app with a hands-on approach with over 60 interactive courses in math, science, and computer science. Brilliant puzzles you, surprises you, and expands your understanding of the modern world. The best resolution you can make this year is investing in your STEM skills. So go to brilliant.org slash vector and finish your day a little smarter every day. Thanks Brilliant and thanks all of you for supporting the show. Now that's my not quite so hottest of hot takes on Apple's Q1 2020 results. And I'd love to hear yours. Hit like if you do, subscribe if you haven't already, it really helps out the channel. Then divest that bell gizmo so YouTube will actually tell you when new videos go live. Then hit up the comments and let me know. 
Thanks for watching. See you next video.